everyone and welcome to the Seeds of Healthful Motherhood Summit. My name is Vera Stepina. I am your host. And today I'm introducing you to Rebecca Mickey. Rebecca Mickey is a children's sleep consultant and she's been working with children since 2004. Uh, Rebecca, hi. How are you today? Hi. I'm really good. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much. Thank you for making time and recording an interview with us. And my first question is, uh, tell us your story. What inspired you to become a children's sleep consultant? Well, my band is in child development. I qualified in the UK many, many years ago. That was families and in daycare and all of these different settings for many, many years. Um, and moved, moved around a lot, had kids, uh, and ended up starting my own parenting consulting business uh, where I was working many times with families who were having issues with uh, discipline or, or toddlers with many, many tantrums. And when we was working with these families, we were figuring out that we were having to be dealing with these sleep issues. So the children were waking many, many times a night or only getting five hours of sleep. And that's why they were having discipline issues and loads of tantrums. So we would fix the sleep issues. Everything else would fall into place. And this was happening again and again and again. And at that point, I decided I needed to change my business to solely be working with sleep because that is what people were really having issues with. And that really impacts everybody's, the whole of your life. If you're not getting enough sleep, um, you're sleep deprived. When you're a parent, you understand why sleep deprivation is used as a form of torture. It is torturous. Um, and so working with families, teaching them how to get their kiddos to sleep better affects absolutely everything from relationships to food choices to everything um, and so getting a good night's sleep is so, so vitally important and I really want families to start making sleep a priority um, and so, so that's why sort of my business evolved this way into doing this and I've been working with families for over 10 years now. Well as you mentioned um, you noticed that not enough sleep, lack of sleep affects our kids mood and and everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, from my own experience, when I don't get enough sleep, which is, um, I don't know, every day pretty much, uh, <laughs> I wake up moody, I'm tired, I'm uh, frustrated, I get angry easier. Uh, what are some examples of the way that sleep or lack of sleep affects our kids' mood? It's a little different to the way that it affects us. Uh, we know that when we get tired, we begin to slow down, we're lethargic, yes, we're short tempered, we don't make great food choices, we want sort of instant sort of sugary fix to keep us going. Um, and we know what that's like when we feel tired. Children can definitely get that short tempered where they just may be having more tantrums, you can be having some discipline issues. But a lot of the time what happens is whereas we slow down, children who are getting sleep deprived and are chronically so begin to ramp up and they actually get symptoms which are very similar to ADD and ADHD. In fact, throughout this country, Country, we do not know the amount of children who are actually being treated for ADD and ADHD who do not have that and are actually sleep deprived because the symptoms are exactly the same. That is um, amazing to me. As you said, uh, the children actually get an opposite reaction. And I noticed mm -hmm. that on my son. My son is five. He never liked to sleep since he was a baby. Um, when he was nine months old, he waited like 22 pounds I had to rock him to sleep hours and hours walking up and down the hall and then finally um, one day I just gave up I was so exhausted so we did cry it out and he cried for 45 minutes I cried for 45 minutes yeah. and he finally fell asleep so that fixed the problem for a little while then he got older and he, like he just doesn't like to sleep and I can see that he's tired his eyes are red he's rubbing his eyes he's you know moody and then he just won't go to bed. So it's crazy to see that. Yeah, actually, when I'm tired, I definitely want to lay down. And yeah, he told yeah. me, I'll go to bed. Unfortunately, nobody tells me to go to bed. Everybody tells me to wake up. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what I was going to ask is, um, what are the different sleep requirements for kids of different ages? Because I know babies need to sleep this many hours, and like five-year-olds, of course, I'm interested in five-year-olds. <laughs> Very different. So they've just actually changed the uh, the recommended amount per 
24 hours. So a one month old needs to get between nine and 19 hours per 24 hours. Now we know a one month old is not gonna necessarily get a really long stretch of sleep. There may be an hour, hour and a half, two hour blocks, but anything within that, between the nine and 19 for a one month old is classed as normal. Three month olds will need between 10 and 19 hours per 24 hours. Again, many wake ups. Six months is between 10 and a half and 18 hours per 24 hours. Nine month olds need between 10 and a half and 17 and a half hours. 12 month olds will need between 11 and a half and 16 and a half. And then 24 months and up will need between 11 and 15 and a half. That will then stay like that until they get into school age um, and then it will be down to um, between 9 and 13 hours right up until they become a teen. So getting somewhere around 11 hours of sleep is a good amount of sleep for pretty much any child yeah. when it comes yeah. to but, but, but everybody has their own individual sleep need the same way that you do the same way that I do and it's finding exactly what it is that your child needs and making sure that they get Getting that each twenty each, each day. Yeah, because definitely my eighteen month old. Luckily, he really likes to sleep, and he, he always has. Mm -hmm. Like since he was born, he slept fine. We never had to do a credit out matter. Thank God, he somehow you know we got to work it since he was like, like five months old. And but now I ask him, yeah. "Baby, do you want to go to bed?" And he says, "Yeah." And like, thank you, mm -hmm. I love you. <laughs> but it's crazy how the <laughs> other one affects the younger one. You know, like. They have to share yes. the room, and the older one doesn't want to go to bed. And the 18 month old, he's like, Well, I am all grown up too, so I'm not going to go. Uh, of yes. course. Um, and uh, I can tell that since, so I'm pregnant yet again. Mm -hmm. And I usually am good on about seven to eight hours of sleep. And now I get eight hours of sleep, and I feel like I didn't get any. And that is, that is exhausting. Yes. What's your recommendation? Foundation for pregnant women expecting moms. You're going to need to get more sleep, but you're just going to be tired. I mean, this is your third pregnancy. You know how tired. And when you're running up to two little kids as well, you're going to be even more exhausted. Um, so just sort of getting as, as much rest as you can. Napping when you can is really, really important when you're pregnant. Not always easy when you have other children, but if you can get a nap, I would do so. Um, and many women will just go to bed, you know, get the kids down and literally go to bed as soon as the kids are down um, and because they need so much more sleep. Again, it's finding the amount of sleep that you need, but it may be that you're needing more sort of nine, ten hours. Every yeah, night. it's just I always feel like going to bed at 9 a.m., I mean at 9 p.m. because there are um, mm -hmm. the things to get down on laundry to be washed and, yeah. you know, it's important to, you know, prioritize and realize what's more important for you. Because if you get enough sleep, you can actually wake up earlier and do that laundry without any frustration or, you know, feeling of anger. Exactly, yes. You're more efficient if you're, if you're uh, well rested. Because nobody does anything good at 10 p.m. I know that. <laughs> no, apart from sleep. <laughs> yes. Um, so I was going through your blog post and I, a lot of your articles and I realized you are one of those people who are not against co-sleep and me and my younger one we actually shared bed for quite a while because he was really wonderful nursing while laying down that saved me so much time and so much energy and I found that that way it actually worked for me but we have a nice mm -hmm. mattress and you know my husband wasn't sleeping with us when the baby was in bed so can you back up your opinion about co-sleeping why is it okay sleeping anywhere is fine as long as it's done safely and so we really want to make sure that when we're co-sleeping that it is done safely you have to think that the majority of the people on the planet are actually co-sleeping and we're having family beds and families who are all sleeping together um so we, it, it can be done safely you just want some things that you want to be really paying attention to so one of them is the mattress you said you've got a nice firm mattress that's perfect we know that children need, do need to be sleeping on a firm surface we don't want to have any lots of bedding or pillows around it really does need to be 
be, the baby should really be either uncovered or just up to their waist. And it shouldn't be a thick, heavy comforter. Just a sheet or a blanket should be enough. They shouldn't have their head on a pillow um, either. They need to be sort of getting as much space. The baby should be, be between either a bed rail and the, or the wall and mum. The baby shouldn't be in between the two parents. Um, you should be breastfeeding when you're when you're bed sharing. Uh, you want to make sure that your hair, if you have very long hair, that that is tied back, or if you have ties on your night clothes, that they are out of the way, they are tied up. Um, giving your child a pacifier as well, that may actually help um, them to sleep a little better, but it actually is a SIDS reduction as well. Uh, we want to make sure that, that you're not smoking or drinking drinking or taking anything that will make it hard for you to naturally wake. Um, so no sleeping tablets or anything like that. If that's the case, you should not be bed sharing. Um, making sure that there's no gap in between the mattress, the headboard or the footboard or that wall or the uh, bed rail. No gap where the child could sort of could wiggle into. And you want to make sure that when your child is uh, bed sharing, that your child is with, that you are with them. With that whole time so you know what's going on but watching a mother a breastfeeding mother and an infant actually sleep together is fascinating because their breathing is regulated their sleep cycles are, are regulated as well so when the, the baby's coming into a light sleep so is mom um, and so often people will find that they sleep so much better when they are bed sharing because you'll both be coming into a light sleep at the same time but they will probably just latch on and you'll accommodate that and then everybody's back to sleep really, really yeah, quickly. Yeah, I remember it was so much harder when I had to get up and get in the chair and it's 2 a.m. And, like, I was always afraid yes. that I was going to drop the baby. Exactly, exactly. You have, you're more at a risk of doing that if you're maybe sort of sitting up in bed or you're uh, on a couch or on a chair. Um, it's safer to actually nurse laying down uh, than it is because you are more likely to fall asleep and then the yeah baby because you're just as likely to fall asleep when you're sitting back or sitting up because i know that exactly. that happened to me and i like i would like, startle myself and woke up. it's really it's scary and yeah. the baby is so helpless and i mean obviously he was sleeping too <laughs> uh yes. how old is your daughter now i have two daughters they're 10 and, and did you have any problems with them sleeping wise Yes, my eldest was the amazing non-sleeping baby, uh, and my youngest was a great, great sleeper. Uh, a lot of it's to do with their temperament. They have very, very different temperament, and that's what a lot of people um, don't take into consideration when they're looking at sleep. Children who have more intense temperament, so a more spirited, more intense temperament, generally have more issues learning to fall asleep independently. Kids who are a bit more laid back, easygoing, have a much, much easier time. So my eldest is a bit more intense, and she struggled with sleep. My youngest. It's more laid back, easy going. Wasn't an issue. Do they ever, or, or have they ever come to sleep with you in bed? Um, they, so they still sometimes will now, but they now know to go to daddy's side of the bed because he'll let them in for a snuggle. I'm a little bit more, okay, let's go back, let's go back to your room and we'll fix, you know, if it's in a bad dream or something like that and we'll figure that out down there. So now they just go into their bed and they don't bother coming to my side. my five-year-old. He, um, he goes through these phases where sometimes he sleeps on his own and he's okay. He has a nice, um, what's well, well, a full-size bed, you know, it's a part of a bunk bed. Yeah. So mm -hmm. he loves the toys, the whatever stuff toys and the aquarium. And now he's going through a phase where he doesn't want to be in his own bed and he wants to sleep with me, which is I'm usually okay with. But again, I am pregnant mm -hmm. and then, you know, there's husband who, who kind of wants to sleep in the same bed as well. And then there's this yes. child in the middle, in between of us, who kicks and kicks me in the liver. And you know, then there's Belly, oh. and I'm trying to work on him to get him back in his own bed, and he just he's not having it. So, uh, what would be your recommendation? Mm -hmm. how, how do you do you convince them? Do you make them? How do you work with that? I would. You want it to be his idea because you try to force him to do anything it's just an instant for him to just say no so you want to make it a little bit more for his for his idea and that he really wants to do this then he's going to just have no problem with it at all for some children that's usually maybe a, a reward 
reward chart or something very similar um, where you can sort of start with a reward after one night and then getting two consecutive nights and then a reward and a reward could be just a sticker or an M&M or something it doesn't have to be a big thing um, but working on, on sort of the um, letting him know what the expectation is how he can be working towards that uh, and then just encouraging and helping him so if you if he, he's and he's will it probably still come through initially to you uh, and just sort of just then taking him back and just saying ah oh, remember that you you know you won't get that sticker or if we if we don't stay in your room tonight and so taking him back and helping him and giving him that help and encouraging him it it won't take him too long but he may not necessarily be happy about it at 3 a.m. when you're walking him back to his room but so it's just deciding when it's a really good time for you to work on this that you're going to be able to have that energy so maybe most people start when they're making changes to sleep do some on a Friday night it does only take three nights to break a habit so then by the next so week it, you it, done. it does only take three days or three nights to break a habit yeah it, in, that's why a lot of people when they're making it changes with sleep and they use cry it out they notice the results after three nights um but if you're using a more hands-on and more gentle method which are the methods that i prefer the habits have been broken after three nights but learning the new skills does take longer so we begin to see improvements after three nights but it doesn't mean that you'll just suddenly stay in there for the whole night after three nights but you the habit has then been broken and you will begin so to see you're talking about um, sleep training methods and you mentioned that you have have more of a gentle approach to sleep training. Uh, so first of all, what is it? And second of all, what would be a good time to start the child on, you know, helping him sleep the night or on his own? Great, great question. So I came up with a technique and I call it the Mickey method and it's my technique. And I uh, use this technique with families who they've probably tried, cried out and it didn't work. Um, or or it's just something that they're not interested in. Uh, crying out doesn't work for a lot of children. They can keep going, some kiddos, for hours and hours and hours. Um, so it's a more hands-on, a more gentle technique where we're really physically helping the child initially get to sleep, and then we work on getting the parents less and less involved as the nights go on. So we're not expecting too much of the child too soon. Um, so it's a real gradual approach, and we're offering lots of support, lots of picking up, lots of soothing, lots of support, just to really sort of help them to be falling asleep more independently. I think the best time to be, well, the easiest time is between uh, six months and a year old to be teaching independent sleep, sleep skills. But the best time is when the parents are ready. You know, I work with families who have children who are four months old and the parents just do however the child is sleeping or the parents are really ready to make changes and I work with them. I also work with families who have three four five year olds who are at that point that's when they want to make changes so it's only a problem when it's a problem it's not up to me to tell families that oh you have to get your child sleeping more independently now if what is working and that could be co-sleeping or you nursing or rocking your child to sleep if that's working for you and it's working for your child there is nothing to change when you're ready to make those changes whatever the age is that's when you do so because you're more likely to succeed if you're feeling more motivated if you're being told that you have to do something a certain age and it's just not what you're you're really not up for it and it really doesn't sit right with you it's not going to work you're not even going to put the effort in so easiest time is between six months and a year that window is great um but it's whenever the exactly so is true. no matter what people tell me that i need to do i never want to do that unless i actually decide so for, for myself but yeah, but it's exactly you want to do it yeah. or going right running or I don't know doing just whatever that is and uh, I can actually back this up with my own kids as I said my older one doesn't like to sleep my younger one likes to sleep and where was I going with this and then um, um, and I forgot <laughs> <laughs> I was just gonna say that the kid both of them two of them are so different when it comes to sleep habits and um, yeah, Empress, you know, because I had I said earlier that I had to break the habit for my, my son. He was nine months old, mm -hmm. and uh, the cry it out. I didn't like. It. So I know. Yeah, I know there are people who back it's, it up. Oh yes, 
I remember where. My younger one, when um, sometimes he goes through phases when he's sick or when he's like reaching a big milestone when he doesn't want to sleep. So if I just lay down and I say, Michael, it's time to sleep, and he doesn't want to, or he's refusing to, he's not going to go down. He'll cry and scream and mm -hmm. like, jump in his crib, but he's not going to go down. So I actually did something that was um, with some kind of like technique is when I would pick him up and maybe walk around the house, I would not rock him. I would not like push him on anything. We'll just mm -hmm. walk around, read a book or I don't know, like talk or sing or something, and I'll bring him back. And I, I would do that five, six, seven times until he's ready to fall asleep. And, and I realized that it, it may be harder on me. Well, actually, no, it's not harder for me because listening to your child cry for an hour, especially when it's not going anywhere anyway, yeah. that's that's not much easier. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it's crazy how you think your kids are going to be the same or have similar habits or temperaments, and you never know. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately. Be very, very different. Uh, so my next question is the one I skipped. So let's say I had a baby. I'm going to have a baby in June. And some moms, they claim that their child's starting to sleep through the night when they're like two weeks old. And, and mm -hmm. as we are told by nurses and doctors, it's not necessarily healthy for a child that young to sleep more than two hours or three hours at a time. So when mm -hmm. is the child starting to sleep through the night and what does it mean? Because for me, four hours, it's not through the night. No, no. So sleeping through the night is actually getting five to six hours between midnight and 5 a.m. Um, and that's not what I would call sleeping through the night. I need more sleep than that. So that's not, I would not call that sleeping through the night at all. Uh, I would call sleeping through the night uh, when my child goes down to bed, uh, sleeping through until it's time to get up in the morning. That's what I would call sleeping through the night. Many, many people have differing opinions as to when a child can actually do that. Some people may hear from pediatricians that that is at six weeks, three months, six months, whatever. Um, there's no actual medical evidence to prove when a child can sleep through the night. Um, it's just because some children can that they presume that all children can. So there are some children who are sleeping through the night at two weeks old, um, but it doesn't mean that all can. I'm a real firm believer that some children need a feed during the night until they're around 12 months old. They can still know how to fall asleep independently, um, and they can still get themselves back to sleep, but they may still need a feed. It's completely normal for humans to wake between two and six times a night. Um, that's normal. It's not a problem unless your child is being helped back to sleep each time. That's when it's a little bit more of a problem. So teaching independent sleep skills will help with will help with that. Um, but it really depends. A lot of parents as well actually lie about the uh, about the amount of sleep that their child is getting. A study was done in the UK a few years ago, and I think it was about 67% admitted to lying within the last month on how their child was sleeping. Um, so you may hear from a lot of people that their child is sleeping through the night. One, I would just remember that they're probably lying. And what is their version of sleeping through the night? If they're going by what the real version is, that's just five consecutive hours after midnight. That's not really what I would class sleeping through the night. Um, I wish as well we would take away that that whole sort of good sleep or bad sleeper, and it's something that we're asked from when our children are very young. One of the first things you ask is, are they a good sleeper? Well, they kind of sleep like a baby, and of course they're good. They're a baby, um, and babies wake often. Uh, but there is this sort of bit of a competition with getting that good sleeper, and, and it can be devastating if you don't have a great sleeper because you think that you're failing, and it's nothing to do with you. Uh, it's just some children wake more than often and need more help during the night than others. Eating a little bit more food will help them sleep longer or it's not necessarily true? No, a child will need so much milk per 24 hours. We obviously want the majority of that to be during the day and then topping up during the night. But, but hunger really does govern those wake-ups initially because their stomach is so tiny. Uh, it's the size of the, their fist. So when you think of how big big a newborn's fist is it's tiny and so if you're nursing breast milk is designed to be digested very quickly because it's designed for babies um, and 
so it's filling up just a tiny amount it's digested very quickly and so your child is hungry again soon um, so as the child gets bigger they were able to take more milk and then it will sort of take longer than to digest and that's when you start getting longer stretches but initially hunger will be the reason for and the, that is you know, for all wake ups okay um, yes well my last question is not really related to sleep or I guess it can be uh, for you as a wife as a mother as a owner of a successful business um, what is balance for you like what would you describe as balance in between your life and like in being a mother and being a businesswoman or um, uh, you know just a woman and a mother it's a really hard balance it, and it's very frustrating and it's constantly changing and um, depending on age of children um, how much my husband is working if I need to be traveling for work it's just a constant sort of I wouldn't say it's more of a balance it's more of a juggling that's what it seems to be is just sort of trying to keep everything moving as it should be I found that um, as children get older it certainly gets easier um, for example this week my children are on mid winter break and I know I can I can do this interview fine because I know that you know I'm not going to have anybody coming up with you know needing a drink or needing their nose wiped or, or something like that so it definitely gets easier as my children get older um, but that whole juggling it is just a, a constant um, sort of keep trying just trying to keep everything where it needs to be and it's completely exhausting sometimes it really is um, I'm obviously uh, not from the US um, I'm from Europe and that's where all, all my family are so we have we don't have any family support uh, my husband is Italian so we don't have any in all his family here in Italy we don't have any family support here um, which definitely makes it more of a challenge um, but it's me trying to sort of cram in as much work as I possibly can during the day while the kids are at school and they are at school so I do have that um, benefit and then sort of then once they're home from school that's then family time and it's prioritizing that and not letting anything really eat into that if it does it doesn't eat into it for very long it may just be one evening or something like that and and then if I need to when the kids are in bed then I will do a little bit more sort of just finishing up and obviously my bed's good, my kids go to bed early <laughs> they don't like that <laughs> Everything is a good time. It's, um, there's one important thing to remember for all of us um, moms working moms or stay home moms we always feel so much guilt when we didn't have time or desire to finish everything that we wanted to and, and there are days when kids are just not having it when they're sick or they're tired or they're just in a bad mood because they're humans and we get so angry at them because they won't let us you know finish whatever that email and I find it so much easier to just not, not let that guilt eat me alive I'm not saying uh, you shouldn't uh, yes. care about what you have to do but I'm just saying to sometimes you know maybe switch the priorities a little bit so enjoy the time with your kids and have them go to bed peacefully yeah. and then maybe you'll have more time or in the morning yes exactly yeah I always sort of you know this year my motto is family is always family always comes first and making my business sort of work around that and I'm just that's something that I'm constantly reminding myself of because when your kids are a little bit older and they're doing their homework or whatever it is that they're doing after school and I just think well I could be now checking my email or I could be just sort of replying to that thing that I needed to reply to and it's just, just like no I need to be really present now and just sort of showing that I'm not going to do that but it's really tough with today's sort of society which is so instant and 24 7 it's really hard to sort of to put that away and to just try and be really present with my family and it's just a constant yeah, I'm constantly that, having to tell myself and I've said that many times before is no matter what we do no matter how we try to do it whether we want to work or maybe we want to stay home with our kids and homeschool them or, or maybe we want to do cloth diapers or maybe we are having a corporate job or something you're, you're going to be judged and you're going to be shamed for whatever you do because there's always somebody else who is doing things differently and who thinks that their opinion is much more important than yours so i would say screw them do what you feel mm -hmm. is good for you and your family 
and it's eventually that's what's gonna bring you more happiness and more success and the balance that doesn't exist what we're trying to reach yeah definitely i think it's hard though now especially with like facebook because people are only posting the good stuff they're only posting the really nice dinners that they're cooking they're not posting the cereal for dinner you know the, the days when you just can't you know or the takeout that you're getting again nobody posting that people are just posting the really good stuff and then if you're thinking okay it's cereal for dinner that then you're sort of when you're seeing everybody else is posting the wonderful lasagnas and everything that they've made it does make you think oh crap we had cereal for dinner and so i think it is really really tough to be a parent nowadays because everybody's an expert the internet makes everybody an expert on things and it's just that we're getting kind of shamed into trying to be that sort of that perfect sort of pinterest mom but is not actually nobody's doing that I mean even when you're seeing those amazing pictures of the amazing dinner you don't want to see what the rest of the kitchen looks like because it looks like you know every single pot has been used and so it's just remembering that as well that what we're seeing of everybody else's life is just a time it's just that perfect picture on Facebook and that's you know and everybody else has got the same fight in the same fight and trying to sort of joke you know, dig out of that humongous pile of laundry. We're all trying to do it and just sort of you know, actually, remembering that about Sunday, I finally took out the dry laundry from the Sunday before because I had to do another load and there was no any room. So I actually had to do that, but I didn't post about it on Facebook. I'll be, yeah, but I did post my wonderful workout no, and my height yeah. that I did in the morning because everybody wants to look good. And I mean, it's normal, it's a human nature. Yes. Well, Rebecca, thank, thank you so much for yeah. the advice on sleep and you no know, sleep and everything. Uh, thank you so much for the time and for everybody. Again, this is Rebecca Mickey. She is a sleep, children's sleep consultant. You're going to have the link to her website in the email that you received this morning. And my name is Vera Stepina. This is Secrets of Health Motherhood Summit. I hope to see you again. Thank you.